All right. Well, welcome to Roof Talk Radio Podcast. We are back after a super long hiatus. Um, obviously, quite a bit has gone on in the world since the last Roof Talk Radio show, and uh, namely a pandemic that's uh, affected the word world globally and uh, quite a few industries, including the roofing industry. But I'm excited to get the podcast up and rolling again. And, uh, you know, as always, I want to diversify this podcast, talk about all different aspects of roofing. Um, whether it's budget setting and, and tracking of, of spend on buildings, whether it's focusing on roof replacements or roof restorations, um, repairs, all the different aspects of roofing. I want to try to bring it to you in a fashion that, in my opinion, can make roofing interesting. It's a pretty boring topic, and I know building owners like to focus on things like marketing and advertising their business more than they like to focus on roofs and, uh, and non-money generators. But uh, definitely roofing can be something of interest. And uh, who better than, than Jonathan Sherwood? If you have not followed Jonathan Sherwood on LinkedIn, I recommend that you do that and, and connect with him on LinkedIn. He puts out content all the time and content that is the opposite of boring. Um, actually, it was one of the very first times I said, wow, somebody can make roofing cool on social media. So um, I want to introduce you to Jonathan Sherwood, let him kind of speak a little bit about himself here. And uh, he's very well diversified, it has all different kinds of aspects. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things he does today and uh, dive into the show a little bit. But but Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, if you could take just a minute, maybe introduce yourself, a little bit of your background and where you've come from and what you do today. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jeff. And, and, and thank you for for having you on your podcast. You know, I, I appreciate what you're doing. And, you know, I believe we're in a time in our industry, I've been saying like the last two or three years where we're looking for leaders of what is right, not followers, of what is wrong, and just mm -hmm. some little pillars. And with what you're doing here and what I've seen on your social media, I believe you're one of those people. So I, I appreciate that because this is an amazing industry. You know, I've met some of my best friends and some of the greatest people uh, in this actual industry. Uh, I usually don't get into talking about myself too much because I'm just not that important. And I just usually trying to give, you know, value to the people that are listeners. So I'll take this time just to kind of talk a little, a little bit about how I got into the roofing industry. And, Fantastic. you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, I came from a background of uh, substance abuse and organized crime and, uh, you know, just uh, growing up in the streets and no father figure, no spirit of influence and just made a lot of poor decisions. Uh, by the grace of God, he had a different plan for me. And that's one of the reasons I have such a heart and passion for the industry and for the roofers in recovery, which I'm uh, on the board with uh, Paul and Kim Reed and Eric Oberant. And that's probably the thing I like the most about everything that I do is getting uh, to have the ability to be part of a nonprofit that's in the roofing industry, that we have a meeting that's similar to AA, but we're not an AA organization uh, every Tuesday at 9 p.m. Uh, Central on Zoom. And then the thing I like the most that we do is we find individuals in the roofing industry. It can be anything from, you know, a sales guy to an owner, to an office gal, to an actual installer, applicator, anything in the roofing industry uh, that there is that are, are needing re rehab, don't have the money for it. We'll vet them and we'll pay and put them into treatment and then work with them after the fact. So, you know, that, you know, coming from the background that I did uh, to where I'm at now is probably my favorite thing out of everything else that I do. So now let's get into how I got into the roofing industry and what I actually do in this industry. So I actually got in the roofing industry because I was losing everything that I had. Uh, as I said before, I was making some poor decisions. And I met a gentleman who his job at the time was taking inbound phone calls for merchant credit card machines and solving problems, troubleshooting. And he worked in a call center making eight and a half dollars an hour. I think this was, I think I've been in roofing for 13, a little over 13 years now. And he got into roofing as a sales consultant and I watched him revenue 800,000. And I think it was like six to eight months. And he was not a very good salesman. He was just a really good man and did good business with people. And I'm like, okay, if this guy can do this, then, then I know I can do this. Well, I had a friend who uh, was on unemployment and he had saved up his unemployment money. And he came to me and he said, listen, when you're sober, you're the best salesman I know in shoe leather. He's like, if you're sober, he goes, I want to start a roofing company with you. Let's do it. I knew nothing about roofing. 
I got into it with him. I started banging doors and just selling residential roofs. I saw how lucrative it could be. Uh, I flipped that into like, I think 1.5 million and just kept putting it back in the company and really learning, got some different training, uh, got some certifications and started making a career out of it. And before I known 2016, it hit and I sold that company to the regional operations manager, John Mansville. That company was started in Denver, Colorado, and we grew it. It was uh, predominantly residential. I even got into commercial and fluid applied, but I was looking for something bigger. Before that sale had happened, I was already searching for something more. What better place to start than the number one collateral damage state in the nation uh, being Texas? I had some good referrals from distribution. They let some of the companies out here know that I was coming out here to play ball. And I was looking at some really large companies to kind of partner with. And I thought that was the route I was going. And I ended up going with a very small company. They were like an 800 square foot office, but they were very good at generating opportunity. And they were just dabbling in roofing, but they had had extensive general contractor experience. Well, I ended up going on as a sales consultant. We grew, ended up, I think, in the top 150 roofing contractors uh, in the nation. I think we, I got them to number 15. I became the vice president over the development company. I then took the president's chair. And then I said, you know what? Time to brand myself. Time to get out there and just start doing things on my own. And I told myself, I was like, I don't ever want to own a roofing company again. I'm okay with being a consultant. I'm okay with doing trainings. I'll be a gun for hire, but I'll sub everything out. So that was my game plan. Uh, my game plan is obviously not what ended up happening, but I started doing, you know, the Jonathan Sherwood brand, the Roofers Helping Roofers, which I had never even really planned on that happening. The Roofers Helping Roofers was just an organically thing that was grown. Basically, guys were just calling me from all over the nation, asking me questions, FaceTiming me. There was no monetary compensation exchange whatsoever at that point in time. And it developed into what you see today in a business and ended up getting trademarked where I do project uh, procurement and fulfillment for some of the smaller contractors that are 80, 90% residential, 10, 20% commercial, or some of the large players like Triangle DJ Contractors National, Northwest Roofing National, Select Construction, which I grew them, uh, that are much larger, where I go in and help them uh, just get the jobs done and make sure I leave the meat on the bone for them and just do complete turnkey uh, with my own company. Uh, because of that, I needed the control. So then what did I do? Open another national commercial roofing company. So went from residential one that I sold to the guy at John Mansville to what we have now. I'm a managing partner of Surefire Seamless Systems. And we're a national uh, chemical roofing company, whether it's uh, SPF foam, uh, all of your different elastomerics, you know, your urethane, your acrylic, your silicone. And all of that just developed into what you see at the conferences and the keynote speaking engagements and the panels. So it just kind of happened. Uh, I didn't really know getting in this thing a long time ago that it was going to develop into the career that it is today. But now I just love what I do. I have a heart and a passion for it. And I get to fly all over the United States and either teach people how to do what I do, tell them to put their twist on it and steal shamelessly, help people do what it is that I do, and then do my own projects as well. Wow. Well. Wow. Well, as a man of faith, I'm going to stand at the pulpit for just a minute and say, I don't think any of this just happened to happen for you. God put his hand on you and he touched you and, and uh, he, you have done some amazing, amazing work that uh, that is no shorter than than his work. So um, awesome to hear what you're doing from a point of recovery. Um, that is huge in this industry. I mean, what industry needs recovery help more than the roofing industry. I mean, I mean, contractors in general, but, but roofing, you, you know, better than I, um, there's a lot of people in, in need of help out there. And, uh, and man, thank you for doing that. Um, the roofers helping roofers again, it, like you said, you weren't asking for compensation in taking these phone calls and advising these people of, of, of how to help, uh, the people they're doing business with, but what you were doing was was you were putting money in the bank there. You were you were literally doing things to help build up your character, number one, but giving you recognition as as somebody who knows what needs to be done out there and as somebody who can become an advisor, an expert in the industry. And uh, and I my hat's off to you, man. You 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 did something in a way that um, was done, in my opinion the absolute right way through humility and through giving 
And, uh, you know, it's not about sales. You, you mentioned this earlier today that, um, you know, it's problem solving. This is what you, this is what you bumped into, uh, with the gentleman you were talking about that was on the phone making these phone calls and solving problems for merchant accounts and um and with that being the case you, you I, I heard you say he wasn't a great good salesman but it sounds like to me he was a good problem solver mm-hmm. and uh in my opinion that is you know the sales of old of of trying to twist people and trick people and, and, and get people, you know, doing something that they're not even realizing they're doing, but they signed the dotted line. And now we got a sale like that to me is, is not the right direction for, for life in general. But I think sales has gotten such a bad rap because of that, that if we can focus on being problem solvers, understanding the problem that's before us and solving that problem, we don't need to sell something. We just need to help something. And, uh, and if my hat's off to you, Jonathan, seriously, you've done amazing work. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And so to kind of take that and segue that into some of the different aspects of what you do and how do you problem solve, uh, when you are meeting people that, that have an issue going on with their roof, what I have found personally in this industry is that you kind of have two buckets of, of contractors out there. And very seldom do you find somebody that's navigating both of the waters really well. Um, What I typically see oftentimes is that you have membrane contractors, if you will, for lack of a better term, guys who are are about roof replacements or or overlay roofs um, that that, uh, they're coming up with solutions to solving a, a failed roof situation. And then you've got other groups of contractors that uh, are about restoration and restoring these roofs and doing um, coatings and monolithics uh, type of solutions that that help with um, restoring the existing roof and still providing that same type of value with with um, that a new roof does which ultimately what's what's the objective here it's keep water out of my building right keep water out of my building and keep my costs down as low as possible through the life of that roof system so i would like to hear um if you don't mind cuz i don't come from a real strong coatings background my my background if i were to say i fall into one of those buckets it would have been the former bucket of of um, I'm going to talk to somebody about a TPO overlay and and potentially peeling uh, a, a top layer roof down to being able to overlay a, a, the initial roof if we're trying to value engineer something. Um, but the coatings have intrigued me tremendously and even a more more of late with everything going on in the roofing industry. And I want to talk a little bit about that with you as well. But um, can you talk to me a little bit about when you go and you meet somebody and you're problem solving for them? And you're going to give a recommendation for a solution, whether it is a membrane solution or whether it is a coding solution. What is it that you are listening for? What is it that you're gearing for? What makes you make a decision to say, this is somebody who I think going with an elastomeric uh, makes more sense than going with a a, a TPO overlay solution? That's a great question, Jeff. And, you know, what I always like to say before I even kick this off is a very loaded question is, I believe that there is an efficient roofing system for every client's investment. It's not always, hey, it's going to be a restoration or, hey, it's going to be a layover. Hey, it's going to be a replacement. But what I've learned to do over time is I have what I believe is going to be my expert opinion on what the system to be. But like you said before, I'm a problem solver. So I really need to do one of my number one topics, and that's know my client. So I ask the client every time I meet them. What are you looking for in the contract you're going to award this project to? And what does that contractor need to do to earn your business? So I want to know, are we talking about price? Are we talking about warranty duration? Are we talking about a specific system? Are they holding the building? Are they selling the building? You know, does it need to be a transferable warranty? You know, what are they dialing in on and kind of check their temperature? But then I also have to remember, they're not the roofing expert but they still have an opinion and it's still their building or they're still a decision maker involved in their building. So then I have to ask myself, what is going to be the best system that is going to meet their needs, but then also 
alleviate me from warranty claims if possible. Because what's the one thing roofing contractors we don't like? There's nothing like getting warranty claims down the road that pull out of that margin that were almost a little bit unexpected for. Yes, we may budget some for, for claims, but when you're preparing the bid for the most part, you look at the, the profitability and the margin and you're putting that together and you're not expecting to lose a lot of that bottom line from leaks. Yes. So that's one of the reasons that really drove me towards monolithic or seamless waterproofing. So if I'm talking to somebody, let's say we have a 100,000 square foot building. And let's say they have, you know, 40 different leaks and it's failing. And maybe it's a gravel built up and they're getting, you know, proposals from a lot of other contractors to either sweep the gravel, level the gravel out, depending on what the manufacturer spec may be and who they're using. And maybe they're looking, we'll just say they have a fluted metal deck underneath there and they're mechanically fastening down some type of recovery board or ISO and then putting down some, some single ply. And we'll say it's TPO in this case. Sure. Well, what I look at is if we have 100,000 square feet and I lay out a bunch of membrane, one, that membrane's only water shedding. Two, I'm going to drill thousands of holes into the substrate. Well, with 100,000 square feet, even if I have the best installers in the world, they're still human. There might be a few cold welts. It's inevitable for me to get all the water off that roof. I can promote positive draining with taper in a lot of different ways, but there's still going to be at least some bird bathing or some minimized ponding. The seams will probably fail over time. And any problems that I have are going to happen in the first 24 months before the manufacturer begins to hold that bag on the warranty where they would start holding it right from the beginning. So I'm like, how do I alleviate myself from this? So in that circumstance, I'll tell them, hey, a lot of these other contractors may not have the ability to do an SPF restoration like I do. They're going to take your resources, all your materials are gonna arrive here on site, or they're either gonna get boomed on the roof, depending on what market you're in, then your labor force is gonna arrive, and they're gonna to try to custom fit that roof as much as possible with all their different components, their fasteners, their screw plates, their pitch pans, their termination bars, their T patches, roll out your roof on there. It's gonna be full of holes and full of seams. And we're gonna cross our fingers and hope it doesn't fail at all, which done right is still a great system. And I do a lot of single ply, I just did 250,000 square feet on the uh, Mission Tortilla and Tortilla Chips building. So single ply done right is a good system but it's something that large will probably have some failures in the beginning, just so big. we got to be realistic sure. about it. Sure. So what I look at, as I say, I have a monolithic system that I can do like this. One, I'm going to have a hydro vacuum come out here. What's that going to do? They're thinking hydro vacuum. Well, they're going to push a large bell or a vacuum across that gravel surface. It's going to suck up the rocks and lightly mist and clean that existing system. Then what I'll do is put down an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half of foam. So I'm gonna make it completely monolithic. So what did I do there? I alleviated the fastener plates and the screws and I went from water shedding to waterproof. But that SPF foam, what it doesn't do is protect itself from the UV rays. So I need to give it some sunscreen. It's gonna do all the heavy lifting, but I need to put some type of top coat on it, whether it's a silicone or an acrylic or a urethane so it doesn't get burned up in the sun. And then I tell them, okay, were we looking for a 10, 15, or 20 year warranty spec? Well, the specifications, the thickness of the mills, the single ply is gonna dictate what we're allowed to give them as far, as far as warranty longevity. Same thing with our top coat, 10, 15, 20 year, depending on whatever our DFT or our drive film thickness is of that actual top coat that's on there. So in that situation, I find as the contractor, I'm less likely to have warranty claims. Yes, it can still happen. I'm gonna have a more aggressive price point to the consumer and I can offer them the same warranty duration as they want. So that might be one way that I do it. Or it may be a scenario where I don't feel it's a really good fit for it because there's some issues where I think we're gonna to need to do, for example, we may have the same roof. That roof may be waterlogged in some areas. Hmm. Well, if I cover it with the SPF, that those, the moisture is going to evaporate. It's going to cause blisters. But I have single play manufacturers, CSL being Carlisle, has some great warranties. They will actually give you a 20 year on a roof that's waterlogged if you fit their spec. For example, if it's waterlogged and you just use 
low rise foam and 115 mil fleece back and put a one way vent every thousand square feet so that over the years, it allows the moisture to come out. They'll give you a 20 year with a hail rider on it if it's all the way up to spec on that type of roof system where that would be a great fit and efficient for the single ply, but not for the SPF. So it really depends on what, what I'm looking at and it's taking and capturing what the client wants and then also using expert opinion to give them the most efficient system for their investment. Yeah, it, it, and you're absolutely right. I mean, spot on. It is it is based upon each individual circumstance, not only the, the physical conditions of the roof, but what's going on with their business right now. Um, are they looking to go into an acquisition on this building? And at that point, um, you know, trying to offload this thing with as, as little bit of uh, uh, overhead as possible, um, yet making sure that they've got a good product to sell when it comes time to selling that building. So um, all different kinds of aspects that go into it. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. Have you found that the, uh, the clientele, the, the, the mentality of clientele in today's world has changed? Um, I know, you know, these, the, the millennial age, which is, uh, comes well after my, my age, but the, uh, the millennial age is at an age now where they, you know, they grew up in a technology, technological world, right? Everything on demand. And, uh, they don't, they don't understand what it means to wait for something. They want a movie, they click play on Netflix and that movie's playing. They want a, a song, they click download on iTunes and they're listening to the music. They don't understand blockbuster video and they don't understand, you know, Rose records. They, they don't, they don't know anything about that. So when you start dealing with that type of clientele that has this different mentality, what do you find has evolved with the people you do business with, or has anything evolved with the people you do business with from maybe an old school, everything's got to be a built up roof, asphalt roof type of system to now being open to these, the new technology of, of monolithic coatings and, and single ply membranes. I feel that where we're at now and the generation we're discussing are more open to some of these products like the monolithic coating or the chemical roofing. But we have to remember that these really aren't new roofing systems. You know, uh, these have been around since the 1900s. It's just different parts of the United States, different markets, and they just become larger and across the entire U.S. or our nation, especially when we've seen and that we've needed economic relief and spending monies on roof systems. I feel the generation we're discussing is easier to explain them to and are not so set in their ways because the generation previously didn't want to hear a lot about it. And I don't blame them because here's the deal. Anybody with $100,000 can go buy a foam rig. An extra thirty, forty thousand dollars can go buy a truck. That does not make them a foam applicator. But then they go spray roofs, not knowing what they're doing, have no business behind the gun. Guys like you and I walk on it, blisters everywhere. You're pulling up the top blisters, burnt orange underneath. The roof's failing everywhere. And then what do most roofers do? In fact, even this one years ago, before I understood the product, this stuff's terrible. Don't use it. Let me sell you a single ply roof because it was terrible, and I didn't understand it. So I was like every other roofer. I was that guy. Yeah. But I feel that if you not only know your client and draw it out of them, but combine that with know your craft, really know what you're selling in the systems, the manufacturer specs, the warranties, even I recommend getting behind the gun, putting some down and really know what you're selling. And you can explain it and educate this generation because this is an information generation and you can give them information. It's easy to be able to put them in roof systems that make sense for the building instead of getting some of the old school guys who just won't hear it. Cause I got guys that will not hear about foam and we still have to do single ply, but I've learned that if I can educate them on it, if I can say, Hey, let me get some, your boots on a roof, some that I've done like your roof and take them through the process and show them stuff that they'll begin to teeter in the direction that becomes the best fit for their building, not necessarily where their heart and their passion was, or even what may have been my biased opinion on it. So I, I think it's an easier generation to work with if you can provide education information. If not, I think that the generation and any generation should run as fast as they can from that contractor. <laughs> I, I agree. And, and, and it's funny because millennials take such a hit in so many different aspects of, of, of 
you know, we all hear the cliches about the millennial generation that that's derogatory. And in my opinion, it's one of the greatest generations out there because they are so pliable. They are so open to um, new ideas and new ways of thinking that that is where the innovation comes from. And that is where we are able, as you just said, sit down as experts and be able to provide that information to them and now they grasp it, understand it, and retain it in a better way than, in my opinion, any of the older generations ever are capable of doing. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, we have seen this year in the roofing industry, and it's it's consistent with today and, and is going to continue on, I think, for a little bit of time here. I don't know what the for future foresees. Uh, when it comes to the topic of shortages, but um, we are getting killed in this industry with material shortages right now, um, mainly due to the lack of raw materials. Mm -hmm. uh, I just received something from uh, Versico uh, yesterday, Carlisle's sister company that, um, or subsidiary of Carlisle that, that said that they are finding that there is a, there are a lot of distributors that are doing force majeure right now, which strictly basically means on a legal basis that they are breaking contracts for orders that have been placed because they cannot fulfill those orders. Uh, Mansville and, and Firestone are, are talking into the year at best on material deliveries. Um, it's, it's sounding disconcerting to say the least, uh, but I'm wondering, are, are you finding the same thing in the coatings world uh, that that is happening right now in the in the single ply membrane world? Yes, uh, I would be lying if I said I haven't felt it, whether I felt it in price or whether I felt it in availability. Now, with that being said, that's a great topic to bring up because it's going to bring me to a point that if these listeners grasp this, it'll really help them. We are in a relationship business. That's what it is. People dance with who brought them. And we have two different types of contractors. We have a contract, and I've been them both. We've had a contractor who buys materials solely based off of price from any person at any time because it's whatever they can do to maximize the benefit with them. There's not a lot of relationship or partnership in that type of contractor. There's not. So when we go through times like this, when that contractor needs materials, he might be the last to get some of those materials because he's bought from this distribution channel and that distribution channel, this distribution channel. He's always hammering them on price and always hammering on price. Then there's the type of contractors that I think are getting through this and are going to sustain through this. And that's when they look at distribution and manufacturing with their entity as a partnership. It's not always about the absolute bottom line lowest. It might be recoverable in rebates. It might be helped out in uniforms. It comes down to those saying, hey, look, I'm going to purchase my materials from you. I'm looking for rebates, materials uh, when I need them, uniforms that I'm not going to always beat you up on price, but I at least want a fair, good price. I'm going to leverage you for training, for putting me in the right places, for helping me teach my guys. And I want to cultivate a relationship that brings value on both sides so that there's a mutual respect to both parties involved. And people that built those relationships are making it through this. I know guys that are getting plates and fasteners and ISO right now when nobody else can find anything. And I know guys who told me they might get them in July and August, they might get them in September and might not get them at the end of the year or the following year and have lost contracts. Now it's okay to have a backup distribution channel still in building those relationships because you still got to be a smart business entrepreneur. You know, you may have a main channel at, xyz and then have another channel over here that you use did you continue to use just a little bit for to have that relationship and are very open and honest with them but those that have built relationships are finding themselves as i said before making it through this for myself i'm a relationship guy so how did it affect me personally everybody listening saying okay well that tastes good when you said it but how did it affect you what makes you say this so foam the b side is polys same polys that makes poly iso we had Houston, that industrial alley went down from that, that, that freeze. There was a shortage everywhere. Yep. Foam went almost obsolete for a minute. I was able to kind of get an advance notice. I bought a bunch of it. 
And then I was able to find it scarcely throughout. Now, granted, I was paying $1,000 more per set, which is a dollar more per pound at an average of 1,020 pounds per set. So that's a big number. You think of a truckload, that's a lot of sets. You add that on there, we're talking a big amount of money. And I've seen it start to taper back down recently, but I was never without, but I felt it from a price point. You know, then there was other stuff I had to wait a little bit longer for. So I definitely felt it, but I built those relationships and I always teach to have that relationship and to cultivate the relationships that bring value on both sides so that when you do hit hard times, you can pick up that phone and call the distribution channel, the manufacturer, say, hey, take care of me because I've been loyal to you for a long time. And then I've seen other guys that are really going through it, but it's a good time to learn because what does an entrepreneur, entrepreneur do? An entrepreneur finds out what works by failing and they fail their way to success and they apply it to their business quickly when they find out what works. So if they are feeling it, learn from it, build those relationships. Don't let it happen again. Yeah, absolutely. And, and our company as well, same thing. Uh, it is about the relationship. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We, we have been able to um, navigate some rough waters. And again, it's not that everything is clean and clear like it was, you know, even this time last year, we, we weren't feeling the effects of the COVID uh, pandemic the, during that period of time. I think our supply chains were very strong still at that point. Um, I think that we were still getting some raw materials in. Um, I think we just kind of have get, been hit with a perfect storm of, of not being able to get some of the raw materials in here, the supply chain being dwindled and the labor pool uh, being so dwindled down right now. I mean, everybody and their, and their brother is hiring right now and can't seem to find anybody to come to work. So um, I think that that is the, the perfect storm that has caused this. It is something that I have just, again, I don't have a crystal ball. I have no way of knowing this to be the case, but just in my life experience, um, I believe what we're seeing here is a baseline reset is what I would call it when it comes to pricing that um, while we might, we're, we're definitely taking six, six steps back right now um, with price increasing, we might get to a point where we take one step forward, maybe, but I think that the baseline of price increase is going to create the new baseline of average price um, when this whole thing settles down. I don't know too many industries that just because now the supply has picked up, they've been commanding X dollars, they just lower their pricing. So I do encourage people that I do business with, don't, don't, sit on thinking that at some point, you know, down the road, a year or two down the road, that all of a sudden pricing is going to go down. Availability might be better. Timing might be better. But pricing, in my opinion, we're probably um, now is probably still the time to get in and get a project done, because I do think we're not done yet with the increases. And again, at the end of this thing, um, I don't see it necessarily plummeting back down. Uh, what do you think of that? Do you think uh, that that Sounds I, right. I, agree. I agree with what you're saying. And I'll just kind of give you my hypothesis on it. You know, yeah, please, as an entrepreneur, I know that in some fashion, manufacturers and distribution are looking at this as a little bit predatory on contractors. <laughs> I mean, yes, there's some price increasing, but I'm a businessman. I utilize opportunity. This obstacle is becoming their opportunity. Yeah. You know, they want to make there's the price increase, but then they want to make a few more points on something they ever made before. And if they're not willing to say that, then I just don't think they're being rigorously honest with us on that scenario. So I think what we're going to see is increased prices probably to the end of the year. And then I believe somebody will drop their shorts to get everybody to go to them. And then the rest of them will follow suit and we'll still end up higher than when we were originally when it all went down. And that'll be kind of our new baseline. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking Q4, Q1. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I really am. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that this thing's going to turn around. Uh, it's obviously not just the roofing industry. The auto industry has taken a big hit with, with some of their, their materials that they need and, and getting chips for EPA and, and all kinds of stuff that's caused uh, the auto industry to take a big hit. But um, this is obviously the, the effects um, of, of a global pandemic that, that has now caught up to us. And, and I think we're not done yet feeling those effects, but um in the meantime, I'm, I'm thankful that we've got people like yourself out there uh, who can problem solve, who is well diversified and coming up with great solutions. Um, you know, the last thing I, I kind of wanted to hit on with you here uh, is really talking about 
these contractors out there that you're trying to help right now. Um, it sounds like it seems to me more than anything, um, you have put a strong focus of late and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but a strong focus of late of trying to help the residential guys get their toe in the water when it comes to commercial. And as we both know, they're two totally different animals. I mean, they just, they, they really are two totally different. It's all roofing, but uh, you know, shingle roofing versus flat roofing is, is just two, two different animals in and of itself. Um, what, how is that going for you? Are you finding that, that um, people, that companies are able to make that leap? Is it really challenging for them to make that leap? What do you, what are you finding when you're trying to come into these companies and teach them this transition? So I love celebrating other contractors wins. That's, I just love doing, I watch people, love watching people grow, love watching them make it into commercial contractors and still having the residential division as well, because that's the cash flow in most circumstances. The reality of it is not everybody is ready for that jump and they need to be vetted and make sure they're there. One, cash flow, just right off the bat. Are you ready to burn money and know that it's not going to be anything immediate and that you're going to have to hurry up and wait? The other thing is, is the individual, the owner, the managing partners, the team, ready to move out of the residential mindset. We're talking about something completely different. You make a mistake in residential, you buy a roof. Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, you buy a roof, it doesn't cost you your company, and you get through it and you learn from it. You taste some liability and commercial on the wrong project, and that's a wrap, especially in the beginning. You don't just buy the roof and it's over. You know, you could get sued, it could wipe you out, it could really, really hurt you. So those that are in the position to actually do it, and we vet them, questionnaires, talking to them. I think it's amazing to watch them get into the commercial field and start to blow up, start to duplicate themselves, sh steal shamelessly and become, you know, large and in charge on what it is that they're doing. And we do that in several different ways. We have the Roofers Help and Roofers program. I'm one of the coaches and one of the managing partners of the Commercial Roofing Academy. And we love watching all that happen with everybody. So for the right individuals that have been vetted, I think it's great. Uh, I won't move forward with somebody who I don't think is ready for it because I'm not going to be the fall of somebody's entity and their baby that they worked on. They might be doing great at three million a year or something in residential because that's not my place to do that. I want to make sure they're there mentally. I want to make sure they're there financially. I want to make sure they're equipped and what their goals are and what they can handle to move into that commercial realm. That's fantastic. And, and what a great way to help again roofers helping roofers i mean it it says exactly what it is that it is and uh i appreciate you putting that together i appreciate again all that you're doing from the recovery standpoint and and just trying to help you're you you have got a really good focus right now uh jonathan it sounds like uh it's it's happened for quite some time and and the common theme between all of it roofers helping roofers roofers in recovery, the way that you approach clientele and their roofing solutions, you have taken a help approach and you want to help people. And in my opinion, that is the winning ticket for success in anything that you do. If you go in with that mindset, you want to help somebody else, not yourself, yourself, that, that may or may not come, but who cares? It's not the goal. The goal is helping others. I believe personally, that that is the answer and the key for success. So, so again, my hat's off to you. Thank you so much for all that you do. Absolutely. And you know, what I want to do too, is leave this podcast with something free for all the listeners. Uh, I love to give away value. So anybody listening can go to roofers, helping roofers.net. And that will take them to a free 25 minute video that goes over the four things that made me successful in the commercial industry, knowing your client, knowing your craft, set expectations and slow down and they can take notes from it, apply it to their business. And it's a plug and play uh, set of topics that'll help them be successful in the commercial market. Fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, for finding you, uh, connecting with you, I know you're on LinkedIn. Do you do other social media as well? Yeah, but so you'll, you'll, you can find me on Facebook under my name. You can find me on our Facebook private group and ask to be invited. You do have to answer, answer the questions for roofers helping roofers. You can find me on the Roofers Helping Roofers business page. You can find me at Instagram at Jonathan B. Sherwood. And you can find me at LinkedIn 
almost everything under my name or under roofers helping roofers. So go find Jonathan Sherwood. Uh, I can speak to his LinkedIn because that's where I'm connected with him on. He's got some great content on there. Go to all of his activity, look at his posts, check out the videos he posts, always providing value and content, but doing it in a way that's really cool. Good video editing, great music to it. I mean, it's it really does make roofing exciting. So, so go check that out. Definitely stay tuned for more Roof Talk Radio shows. We're going to be doing these at least once a month. Might step it back up to going uh, bi-weekly. But uh, next show, we're going to be talking talk all about solar and talk about what needs to be done to be able to get the most value out of a solar solution. So stay tuned for more Roof Talk Radio. Jonathan, thank you again for joining us today. I really do appreciate the uh, opportunity to have you on here and uh, look forward to hopefully having you on again in the future. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Take care.